thanks for joining with me today. Um, I'm going to give you three different questions um, beforehand. Um, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, Rosa Chang. Um, <laughs> thanks for having me. Uh, thank you for partnering with me these last couple of years. Um, my name is Kenya Miles. I am um, a farmer and a natural dyer. Um, I am the founder of Blue Light Junction, which is uh, a natural dye studio in Fremont, West Baltimore. I am um, an artist, practitioner, um, multidisciplinary, um, and also just sort of a lover of um, plants and um, the experience of earth practice and work. And so, um, yeah, I think it's just who I am and who I've been really blessed to be for the last um, two and a half years full time. Um, and yeah, also to be uh, grateful for my son who is, you know, sort of the inheritor of all of this information, whether he wants it or not. <laughs> Look at your beautiful necklace. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you three seconds to show off. <laughs> That's for you. Yes. Uh, we are gonna jump on that first question that um, tell me about the location where you grow indigo and your um, dye plants. So right now um, I've been growing indigo at Hidden Harvest Farm, which is uh, in Greenmount West, central Baltimore, um, Baltimore City. And um, one of the things that we were doing, Rosa and I, you and I were doing was experimenting with um, just the idea of having a garden that during the Baltimore Natural Dye Initiative, we were able to investigate and sort of live alongside uh, native and historical um, natural dyes in a way that allowed us sort of the freedom of experiencing them, which I think can be often um, you know, doesn't happen in, in, a, in a farm kind of setting. I also was um, growing at Parks and People for the Natural Dye Initiative, um, which is in Druid Hill. Um, yeah. Did you ask me what I was growing? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, do you want to talk about the climate difference or any kind of different experience between that um, the land in Oakland versus um, experience in Baltimore? Yeah, so background um, for me is that I'm from PG, DC, um, but I've lived all over and I, for 11 years prior to 2017 or through 2017, I was living in uh, the Bay Area in Oakland, California. And a lot of that was where I began to process uh, my own um, plants, but also just to be in practice of natural dyeing. And indigo was the first um, plant and the first practice that I uh, endeavored and with zero knowledge and sort of in relationship to a project a friend and I was doing, were doing and her being from El Salvador, she had this idea to use the indigo uh, as part of our practice, but didn't have any idea how to use it. And so I just got really, really um, invested in figuring it out. And uh, I guess that's one thing about me is like just to be a little dogged about something and for better or for worse, <laughs> sometimes it's not the right thing to be dogged about. But indigo was, you know, a really beautiful, magical practice that um, I felt like I could just spend my whole life um, participating in and never really feel a mastery of it and n n not needing it either, just wanting to explore. And for the whole of natural dyes as well. So the weather in Oakland is, I would like to say, perpetual spring. It is not always, but, um, you know, there's a short, short summer where things get, you know, hot. But for the most part, by and large, it's sort of a cooler climate, cooler evenings. And 
that just makes for a really um, easy growing um, environment and moving east and being uh, on this project through the Maryland Institute College of Art with Rosa and trying to work on these plants that, you know, it was funny because I was like, oh, let's grow these native plants. And then I was like, oh, pokeweed is everywhere. But I had already started, you know, like, I was like, look at this thing. It's so new. And they're like, no, it's just over there in the alley. <laughs> oh, okay. So that was kind of the fun part was also understanding that I didn't understand a lot and that there needed to be greater uh, observation. And so coming in as the, the co-farmer on the state farm um, part of the project, that was the same experience was just like, I don't really know anything about weather. You know, we don't really have weather. <laughs> we have microclimates in the Bay and, um, you know, most everything will grow for nine months, uh, if not longer. And I just think that that was a shift uh, coming here and having seasons and having very unpredictable seasons at that, um, you know, which obviously is a testament to global warming and climate change. Um, but I think there's a lot to be said about going through the experience uh, every year and learning a little bit more each time, learning a little bit more every, um, every growing season and going into the third growing season was a little bit um, like, I feel like I have sea legs, you know? I'm sort of like, can, what are we growing? Can we grow things? What happens here? You know, and um, maybe for some, you know, people had this experience, but I definitely feel like it was like the longest winter of my life. Um, personal, um, professionally, just everything. And so getting back into the earth practice has been really gratifying, but also um, a little tenuous. Like it feels like I need to just sort of surrender a little bit and uh, be okay with whatever happens, um, which I think is a, it's, it's a real, um, interplay when you're dealing with um earth and the environment and nature and planting and you know it's like it's not up to you to make this thing anything you know you're there to facilitate you're there to support you're there to be um a tender and a guider and um i think it can look a number of ways but it also shouldn't look like um an expectation or a judgment or um yeah, I think things that create um, essentially like a value around something. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're this, then you have to be this. Um, so just liberating ourselves a little bit this season, I think, is the road forward for me. That's great. Um, yeah, the weather was really unpredictable, and we would have a snow in like a late April and like wind blow and yeah it, it's been very interesting oh, a lot of rains two summers yeah. ago and yeah. yeah um okay we are now moving to the next questions um tell me about your indigo what kind of indigo plants have you grown and also do you have any particular plants experience that you want to share with us so I'm awful with botanical names. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to be like the kid on the street who's like, this is what I grow because it's the, you know, the street name, I would say. But um, so what we've been growing on the state side and for our, our practice at Hidden Harvest for the last two years uh, is the Japanese indigo. Um, and Part of what we did we did grow um, was we tried to grow tropical indigo, um, which it's not that I don't know what it's called. It's that I don't <laughs> sufructose. I never say it right. Indigo fair. Uh, yeah. So we. So what was the kind that Gasali gave you? That's a different plant. Yeah. I, uh, he's he called it elu. Elu. Um, yeah. Um, I will look into the scientific name too. I, I don't um, have it. So that I can't name. say it either. I'll just, Alu sounds great. Yes. I also like that as a name. <laughs> um, 
so yeah so we were growing um basically the the strain that grows easiest in the in the northern climate um there are many obviously um strains of of japanese indigo and i think for us um for me at least growing it i, I had the experience of growing it in in oakland um but also like it 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 developed differently on the east coast for me as well so just even understanding that plant here and um you know i've always been a big fan of marigolds um so we've grown a lot of marigolds in our time um we grew well this year actually successfully i think we actually have some seeds so i'm, I'm hoping to seed from that um we also grew Hopi sunflower, Hopi um, blue corn. We grew two different kinds of cotton, Sea Island cotton, um, brown and green. We grew, um, I'm trying to think, flax, two different kinds of flax, mm -hmm. hemp, two different kinds of hemp. We have in the garden from the first season, um, that like don't need us at all um yarrow which is full on in its life um uh yellow dock amaranth um we grew something called wayache which um is a marigold um but gets really tall and it smells like amazing the flowers are really really tiny white flowers um but i'm super in love with that plant right now um and I think we have matter root that we started from the first season that will be in its third season or third year this year. So theoretically, we can um, start to harvest some of our matter to check the um, amount of pigment and alizarin it's producing. producing. So that I'm excited about. Um, but we had a lot of plants that we grew that were in relationship to historical um, experiences of Black Americans of people who were also um, indigenous to the land. So we're kind of looking at this thread of all of those things. And I think um, just have had the experience of, you know, people sort of connecting to different plants in different ways. And I for sure really connected to the Sea Island Brown cotton that we grew um in the first season and then sort of exploded and grew much more in the next season and this season you know we'll see how many we we propagate but like just that idea of like having um watching this cotton grow from um a seedling to then like getting it to sprout to then the flower coming um or the the leaf coming out of the um seed and then you know just watching it grow and and it's been so amazing and then you know for it to go from a flower for the flower to drop for then there to be a bowl and then the the pod open it's just amazing so i i definitely enjoy getting to know plants now where i think in the first the first season we were growing at hidden harvest we were like grow everything you know we just grew so much stuff um, and then we didn't get time to know the plant, you know, it would be time to harvest or was it time to harvest? And people would say, well, what is this? Like, I don't know, uh, something, and I don't know what it does and, or, you know, not that it needs to do something, but that there, what do we expect? What is our intention for it? Um, and just thinking about that, um, made me go a little slower the second season and now in the third season just keeping things as small and as close, which is what I understand um, now is a practice that I wanna uphold. It's just like taking the time to investigate things um, and understand things a little bit, a little bit more um, connected. That's great. Um, it's kind of off to the question, but um... Can you tell me a little bit about um, what kind of colors or experience do you were able to get from a, um, a variety of natural diet plants you've been growing? Well, or like what do you like the most? I mean, 
it, I think it's not a right question because everything is very different. But. Yeah, I think one of the things that I learned in doing natural dyes, you know, previous to this experience is that um, where there were colors that I didn't feel really like, like, oh, I'm not a pink person or, oh, I'm not, you know, purple's nice, but I don't, I wouldn't wear it. Um, I think when you see something that's naturally dyed, there's, there's almost this like relatable palette. It's like, you know that this is also made of the same um, stuff that you come from too. Like it's made of the same earth, it's made of the same components, it's made of the same nutrients. And there's something really, um, I think, kin about the color. And so now I love, I love pinks that are, um, we're just talking about this um, in the headshot that I'm wearing the, <laughs> Um, the the dress the roots. yeah christy johnson made which is dyed she's also a natural dyer amazing and you know it's it's matter root and it's like my favorite um one of my favorite dresses and i even dyed a matter root slip that i wear underneath it um mm -hmm. because it's a gauze so you can kind of see through it but that so the slip is a little bit deeper red and then it's this is like a nice corally pink um, and I, I never would have worn anything like that before, you know, it just wouldn't have been my style. Mm -hmm. Um, but it feels like, um, the colors, some part of you, um, because of its base origin, uh, being from the earth. And so as we all are, so I think all of the colors I really delight in, I have to say, you know, it's, it's kind of like being in the garden with Rosa where she'll find something and it's like, Oh, you know, she's like, she's <laughs> It's just super excited and then yeah. overreacting. And then like, what, what is it? And she's like, Oh, did you see this thing? You know, and it's like, you don't know, it's cool and and childlike and just true. And so that's how I feel about a lot of the colors is that like when I see it, I'm like, Oh my god, look at that marigold color. You know, like that is just the best color. Um, or if I see something that I haven't seen or it wasn't something that Someone will say, oh, I worked on this. Can you tell me what I did wrong? I'm like, look how beautiful that color is. You know, and I'm like, well, that's not the color I wanted. I'm like, but don't you like this color? <laughs> like, no, I was trying to get like orange and now it's like gray. And I'm like, but look at the richness of this. <laughs> um, so I think for me, it's like, I just, I'm so open to like, whatever comes from the color it's why i don't like to do a heavy production dyeing because mm -hmm. you need it to be something right like the client is paying there's an expectation everyone's waiting is it going to be this can it be that and it's like i love the i'm doing my own thing mm -hmm. right like that's what this this plant is saying i touch this thing i touch this thing or i was grown you know i was enriched with this you know mineral i was enriched with this you know, fertilizer and like, I'm coming up all kind of however I want, you know? Um, and so I love and appreciate that. And so, you know, we've processed indigo and, and made some really beautiful um, indigo. And we've also done a lot, I think with um, definitely yellows. We have a lot of yellows that we've grown, um, but also over dyeing, um, making grays or making um, greens, um, I think have all been really beautiful experiences. We have we have yet to sort of um, test, I think, a lot of the plants in our dye garden, um, mm -hmm. which I would love to do this season. So you heard it here. <laughs> it's we're gonna do it, Rosa. We're it is this year. Yeah, this year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Email us. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. We, we just tend to be doing the most so that's half the problem is like just wanting to be a little more um like i i the students who've gone through the mica project um like i just admire them like sitting around and testing pots and you know i'm gonna try this thing i'm experimenting with this and i'm like i sure do wish <laughs> i could have some time for that um but i think it's, it's also been really um nice to be facilitating the space for people to do that you know um 
so yeah we've done a lot of colors but i think mostly what we've done is give people the inspiration to find their own colors you know mm -hmm. it just reminds me of the the louis yeah with me mm -hmm. our um plant's godmother <laughs> <laughs> she, I uh, remember one time when that I think that was time when we visit her um, garden for the first time. We were asking about, oh, what is this plant good for? And we were keep asking, and then she would say, what you are good for. <laughs> so I was just really intrigued um, how everything is so different, and each plant itself has their own meaning and their own character. That's like us, not in t instead of like, oh, this is weed and this is not weed. And when even you made a rule at the garden that like, we are not calling that those plants called weed, but we are gonna say that's plants not being cultivated. <laughs> it was a little bit long for me in the beginning, <laughs> <laughs> but the indigo would like say so clearly and then guide us to everyone. And like, yeah. no, this is not weed, this is plants we are not cultivating yeah. so i think yeah. also I think just also like the just like the, the plants that we have um that were already in the garden space you know that i don't have a relationship to but like just because i don't know anything about this plant doesn't mean that it isn't knowable it you know mm -hmm. that it doesn't have some um some space where it, it exists without me. Uh, and so I think that a lot of times, like we, we sort of think that um, something exists because we see it, but it's like, I was here before you saw me, right? And so that's how I'm learning to engage in work in the garden and, and earth work is like, um, one of the conversations I had had um, with Christy was like this conversation around weeds and you know our understanding of like the use you know everything has to have like a purpose like what can you do like louise was mm -hmm. saying um but i think one of the things that i've connected is that like it's a very colonial thing to think because i don't understand your nature you must be destroyed right so mm -hmm. you're like oh wow i don't know anything about this thing i'm just gonna take its life away instead of humbling yourself and saying, hi, good to meet you, you know, can you tell me more? Investigating, sort of being around and being um, available. Um, so it's, it's often very challenging for me to like go into the garden, especially in the spring, you know, and start to remove things, which is, I'm so happy everyone does that. You know, people come to the garden super enthusiastic and Sometimes I'm like, do we know what that is? Why are we doing, you know? And it would just be like a big old bush if it was my, my life because I sort of just feel like I'm, I'm, I need some time. I don't know. I don't know. What are you, hey, what are you doing over mm -hmm. there? What's going to happen when you flower? Um, so, but part of that is that there were species that were brought over during, um, european colonization and that are actually sucking out native plants so there's a real need to get to know um what the what the landscape is you know what the ecology is of a space um and you can't do that without experiencing it and it takes time it all takes time mm -hmm. yeah um you're gonna move to the last question that's the question about local languages and cultures um i mean i i really would like to interpret this with your personal story that how your culture being related to the natural die and how you got that inspiration come from so yeah um well i don't i i i mean obviously we all have a story and we all have a relationship to a thing for me natural dyes were introduced in um my travels and living in oaxaca mexico so i learned about natural dyes but i never worked with them while i was there while i was there i, I made the uh, um, specific goal was to learn um different 
weaving techniques and um, embroidery and things like that. And so that's what I spent my time doing, like living there for a year. And um, having traveled back many times, um, I, I've come to understand more about natural dyes um, through practitioners. But I sort of started off with the process of doing it in Oakland with this friend. Um, and Indigo was the first juncture for that. And, um, you know, I think that that sort of coupled with this history of travel and learning practices in different countries from different artisans and practitioners who have this like long history of technique, I, I sort of understood that as, a, as, as an African American, as a Black American, my history has been um, cut off for me in a lot of ways. And so I don't really have this like, I'm going to snap, you know, reach back and connect to this specific uh, cultural um, space. And I think there's some being comfortable in that, you know, because you do feel like um, a motherless child in a way, like there's some um, richness that you've missed out on because you've been sort of cut off from these stories. And, and, um, and so I think what I try to do is really focus my energy on um, understanding and learning tradition, but not appropriating it or, or, or co-opting it as my own, but acknowledging that like, there's also a legacy to people who are practitioners in their own right, who, you know, are like me, you know, American, um, without uh, a, a story of immigration or a story of, um, you know, like legacy that I would know. My family are farmers. Um, and so I come from a farming community in Virginia and um, also cotton um, and people who were uh, enslaved. And so, I think I draw from that like this very clear space of um, being people who abided by practice and earth out of all of the things that were essential. You know, if I needed food, I have to grow it. If I need water, I have to find it if I need. And so what are the things that I need as a person here spiritually um, emotionally, mentally. And so for me, the practice of natural dyes is an amalgamation, is like a combination of all of those things. Um, there isn't one direct linear line to it. It really is um, a story that I'm making all my own. You know, it's a path that I'm forging all my own. And I think that um, gets clearer as the days, as the years, as the decades go on, but there's also, it's not finite and there's no end to it, you know, it doesn't culminate in a thing, you know, maybe there'll, there will be something, you know, when it's the end, but I think my legacy is really having people understand that there's so many other things besides what we know, especially in America. Um, there's so many practitioners who are doing this work, who deserve space on the stage um, to talk about that and to also actually like be able to make money doing it um, and so wanting to always honor the graciousness of my teachers um, and offer people an opportunity to um, come into a space that has gotten dominated by a particular type of person um, and so I think I'm just here to tell a different story. Um, and it's not a story that's steeped in like um, a very specific uh, tradition. It's this interest of mine to be in sort of um, conversation with all of these um, practices and all of this work and just to feel very grounded in my own honoring and, and understanding of them and that there's a, there's a space that I can walk to, but I also have to stop and say, that is not mine. And 
um, uplift the people for whom it does belong. And so that's kind of, you know, what I, what I hold myself to be in the work. And yeah, it was a, such a really um, meaningful interview. Um, I have a lot of questions for you that I wish I could ask you now, but um, yeah, I'm gonna hold it for the April 30th uh, when we do the Q&A session. So yeah, thank, thank you so much for today. I'll see you at the garden, Rosa. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you.